the restoration theme has two parts, really. There's the part that's on you, and there's the part that's on God. And this is something that throughout the Bible, you'll see this theme. Uh, my favorite, probably, representation of this is in Isaiah, Isaiah 35, where uh, this idea is communicated. Strengthen feeble hands, steady weak knees, and say to fearful hearts, do not fear. For the Lord your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, and he will come to save you. And in this one verse, you have these three things that are on us. God puts it on us to strengthen our feeble hands, to steady our weak knees, and to say to our fearful hearts to not fear, but that the Lord will God will, uh, the Lord our God will come, and He will come, and He will do His three things. He will come with vengeance. He will come with divine retribution, and He will come to save you. God is going to do stuff that only God can do. And God allows us to do stuff that, that we can do with God. So God's going to do the stuff that only he can do. And we're going to do the stuff that only we can do with him. So God is really kind of over this through, over and through this whole thing. He is faithful to restore us. Yesterday, where we left off with Peter, this idea that Peter was starving for restoration on that silent Saturday, he was starving. He was looking for an opportunity to be restored. And when the one who Jesus loved, and, and first of all, I love this about John. John refers to himself as the one that Jesus loved. And I hope that we would have enough confidence in God's reckless love for us and God's unconditional love for us that we would refer to ourselves as the ones that Jesus loved. Um, but the one that Jesus loved, John, communicates to Peter there he is. There's the Lord. Jesus is right there. And what does Peter do? He jumps in the water and he swims to Jesus. Right? We don't know if he gets there before or after the boat, but he, he cares about nothing other than Jesus. His eyes are on nothing other than Jesus. The stuff in the world, this big haul of fish that they just got, uh, what other people are thinking about him, he doesn't care about any of that. His eyes are fixed on Jesus, the restorer, and he's swimming to him. Then when he gets to the shore, he sees that Jesus is there. Uh, what does he say? Jesus said to them, he said to them, the whole audience, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So what does Simon Peter do? Yes. Oh, is that not her hand raised, Jake? My bad. Simon Peter shoves everyone else to the side. He says, to them, bring me some of the fish. And Peter chucks everyone, checks them into the boards. He grabs the entire net full of all of the fish, and he brings them to Jesus. And it's not a simple task. There's 153 heavy fish, and, and the, the, John is communicating. He's surprised that the net didn't break. It was so full of fish, and it was a heavy haul. And Peter goes over there by himself and brings him the fish. As if he is trying to do something good enough to earn this restoration that he's so starving for. But the restoration and the reinstatement doesn't come with this haul of fish. It doesn't come because he jumped out of the boat and swam to Jesus. Jesus has a conversation with him. After this haul of fish, they eat the breakfast, cooks the stuff on the grill. And then when they're finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Then Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then he said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he asked, Peter, do you love me? And he's kind of frustrated. He even repeats the questions. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. And you know that I love you. And then Jesus says to feed my sheep. And let's be clear, the feeding of the sheep isn't the thing that earns him his reinstatement. The catching of the fish, the bringing of the fish, the swimming to Jesus, those aren't the things that cause the reinstatement. It's this pledge of good conscience to the Lord. It's this commitment that, God, I love you. I'm reciprocating your love for me, your unconditional love for me. It's not in the deeds. And the deeds are an important thing because it's a reflection of what you believe in your heart. But with your heart, God, you know all things. You know that I love you. And that's where the restoration is found. We're broken. We're in several different pieces. 
a lot of different circumstances and scenarios, all different backgrounds, different neighborhoods, even if we're in the same neighborhood and we're, and we're siblings with the people in this room, we still have brokenness that looks different, but the avenue to restoration is the same, and it's Jesus. We're saved by grace, through faith in him. There's no other way. And it's a victory that solely his doing. Dr. Nathan Holstein says this, all our struggles with the process and progress of becoming like Jesus, all of our battles with sin, all of our disappointment and acts of disobedience that we wish we hadn't done, all of these things one day will be swallowed up in a victory that is solely God's doing. And on the second talk, we kind of lingered here on this brokenness for a little while, a little while with all of the things that we wish we had we wish we hadn't done, all the disobedience that we wish we didn't do, all the things we can't unsee, all the acts we can't undo, we were just in this place of kind of dwelling in the brokenness of where we had put ourselves far off from God. God is the one who wants to bring us back. God is going to win this thing. It's a victory that is solely his doing. And in that victory that is solely his doing, he is allowing us to have a certain part of that. The part that looks like repentance. What was repentance? Garrett, I'm not going to yell at you for fake being on your phones. Um, what, what was repentance? This, this two-part thing. What was it? Yeah, Kelsey. Yeah, turning away from sin and attaching yourself to God. This restoration comes through repentance. And it's something that Peter says at kind of the end of his time that looks like this. In the letter, 2 Peter, that he's writing to everyone who's going to read it. It's not just to one specific church in one context. It's to all believers who are going to get a hold of this thing. He says this thing. And me and Thomas and Thomas is smarter. We were talking about this thing that Peter exhorts us to do in following Jesus. Now that you've been restored, now that you know that Jesus loves you, now that there's this victory that's been won for you by him, and it's by grace, not on anything that you've done. But now you're in a place where you can do something. And that something looks like have faith. That something looks like add your faith knowledge. Add your knowledge goodness. Add your goodness self-control. Add your self-control perseverance. Add your perseverance godliness. Add to godliness brotherly love. And add to brotherly love this unconditional agape love that the Father exemplifies for us. These are the things that we can do as we follow as Peter has been commissioned to feed my sheep, as Peter has been commissioned to be the church and be the rock of this church, this thing that even the gates of Hades aren't going to overcome, it looks like following Jesus. So when we ask the question, so what? We've been restored. It's a victory that's been solely won by Jesus. Now what do we do? Now we follow Jesus. And we have this new relationship with him that looks like... Um, an informed faith. Like, we're not going to do these things that cause this brokenness and puts this obnoxious barrier between us and God because we know what it feels like to be far off. And we don't want that. We don't want to be in this place of unprecedented brokenness. We want to be reinstated. We want to be restored to the Father through the Son and the Spirit. And we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we're going to be far off. We want to be reminded that Jesus is the one who saved us. And I want to spend just a little bit of time on what Jesus has done and why he's such a big deal. And it's not just on um, ourselves and, okay, now we have a new relationship and it's up to me to turn to God. I want to give a little bit of attention to this idea of salvation. It's a big word that means to be saved. It's a big word that means that we've been rescued out of our peril, out of our brokenness, out of this situation that we've put ourselves in. And salvation is won for us solely by what Jesus did on the cross. What Jesus did by leaving perfection to come down here to this imperfect place to lead a perfect life, die a perfect death, be the perfect sacrifice so that us imperfect people could be united with the perfect God. And that's what salvation is. That's what the gospel is. And another term kind of used in the same vein is redemption. Jesus paid our debt. He paid for something that we could never afford. Not in a thousand lifetimes put together of doing good deeds. It would never add up because we are finite, imperfect beings. And to be put together with a, an infinite, perfect God, there's just mathematically it's impossible for you to be redeemed on your own with your good works. 
So Jesus comes in and takes his perfection and takes his infinitude and he, come and he, he comes and he redeems us. He pays for our debt that we could never pay. Here's another big word. It's called propitiation. Because of our fallen nature, because of our imperfection, that's offensive to God. And God has wrath towards those who are not with him. And that's instantly us from original imputed sin. We are deserving of wrath. But what Jesus did is he came in and he satisfied God's wrath with his sacrifice. It was solely his doing. We could never sacrifice enough animals or enough comforts or enough whatever to be right with God. It was only the perfect sacrifice that Jesus provided that would satisfy the wrath of God. And then another big word, reconciliation. Being friends with God. When you reconcile with someone, you become friends with them. It's through Jesus and only through Jesus that we can be reconciled to God. And these are a bunch of big words used to describe this victory that swallows up all of our disobedience and all of our brokenness. All the things that we wish we hadn't done. All the things that shame and burden could be heaped on our shoulders and drive us away. We could be like Judas and not desire restoration but be lost in our brokenness. But in our brokenness, God doesn't meet us on the other side of that. He meets us in it in the form of Jesus and he saves us out of it. And he pulls us out of it. Um, I'm going to move on to, to David's deal now. I don't have too much more time, but I want to read a little bit of Psalm 23. Actually, I want to read the whole thing and I want us to be reminded of how much uh, we do. I'm going to ask you a question at the end of this. What is the thing that we do in this passage? Y'all ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What's the only thing that we do in there? We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's the only thing that we do. That's the only thing that we have to offer. He's the one who leads us. He's the one who leads us. He's the one who leads us. He's the one who restores us. He is the one who's with us. He is the one who comforts us. He's the one who prepares for us and protects us. He's the one who anoints us and commissions us. He's the one who has the goodness and the love that he adorns upon us. The only thing that we do is we walk in the valley of the shadow of death. And the next thing that we do in verse 6 says this, then we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a victory that's won by Jesus and Jesus alone. God loves you because he loves you because he loves you. And he loves you so much that he chose you. And in the choosing of you, he decided to bless you with the richness of blessing that you could never imagine that results in this list of leading and restoring and delivering and protecting and enabling you to be right with God so that you can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And if it takes brokenness to highlight the blessing, then so be it. Don't get lost in your brokenness. And I'm not just talking about the brokenness that you brought with you to camp. Maybe brokenness that you received here in camp. I'm talking about when you guys experience brokenness down the mountain, back home, in school, in five years or ten years. When the darkness of your depression just almost snuffs you out. Remember this, that all that can and will be swallowed up in a victory that is solely his doing. Good news. We have a God who is faithful to restore us. Because he's blessed us. Because he chose us.